all day with the exercise. Welcome to our um, inaugural Day with the Experts, um, AAC. We're really excited that you're able to be here. I do want to take care of some housekeeping items prior to um, getting started with my portion of the presentation. Um, I wanted to let you know that uh, you are able to ask questions in the chat section on your Zoom, um, and then those questions can be answered at the end of each segment. And then I also wanted to let you know that at the very end of this webinar, after the um, panel is done, there will be a poll of three questions that will pop up on your screen. And we would like to encourage you to answer those questions and you need to scroll to the bottom of that in order to submit those questions. So thank you so much. And again, thank you for being here today. We appreciate that. I, before I get started, I wanted to give you a brief description of what AAC is. Augmentative alternative communication is any form of communication other than oral speech. So that could be um, communicate that can be body language, facial expression, sign language, gestures, um, low tech communication, or high tech communication. And the low and high tech communication is what we address here in our communication programs at the Weissman Center. So in the next 20 minutes, I am going to give you a history of the AAC programs, um, talk a little bit about our AAC program staff, and then also introduce you to the four different programs that are at our, our, our Weissman Center that have to do with AAC. Those programs are CDP, CASC, AAC Partnership Program and ECHO AAC. And I know I have a lot of acronyms on here, but we will be um, going through each one of those on the following slides. So where it all started. I don't know if any of you happen to see that there was an article published yesterday on the Weissman website. And that was, um, that was printed by uh, and written by Dr. Um, I'm sorry, that was written by a, a, a scientist writer, uh, Peter Jurek, who um, wrote an article in dedication to Ludell Swenson. And you see Ludell Swenson in this photo. He is the young man um, who is using a communication system. And then the two men behind him are um, Greg Vanderheiden and David Lammers. And they were students in the um, program for engineering through the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And they met Ludell when he was 11 years old. And Ludell was uh, an individual with um, cerebral palsy. And unfortunately, he passed away this past April. So the article that's written in the um, Weissman website is a tribute to Ludell and what he did for this communication um, program and what he did to help others with uh, augmentative and alternative communication. And I strongly encourage you to check out that article. It's some great information. So I think it's important to give the history of the AAC programs at the Weissman Center. Like I had mentioned, in 1971, Greg Vander Heiden and David Lammers had met Ludell Swenson. And uh, Greg Vanderheiden was very interested in finding a communication system that would work for Ludell and had asked Dr. Richard Marlowe Marlo, uh, if they could use a portion of the Department of Engineering at the University of Wisconsin to work on um, developing communication systems through technology. And this was the beginnings of the Trace Center. The Trace Center eventually moved to the Weissman Center in 1977. And it went into um, the building to collaborate with the communication specialty programs that were already existence at the Weissman Center. And then it was in 1986 that Julie Gamrod joined the Trace Center. And over her 33 years at the Weissman Center, she helped develop CASC and CDP into the programs they are today. It is through Julie's uh, legacy as an advocate for individuals with uh, uh, com complex communication needs and helping them get 
speech generating devices or communication systems to support themselves so they could self advocate. And Julie did this through many um, efforts through legislative efforts to ensure that uh, equipment would be covered by insurance and also that the therapy would be covered by insurance. Then we also, um, it's through Julie's mentorship with the current staff at um, the Weissman Center that through that mentorship, she was able to educate us on how we can further expand our AAC programs. And so in 2019, there was a grant that was uh, requested through um, by Sarah Marshall and Kat Cantor, and they launched the Augmentative and Alternative Partnership Program. And then this year, we were able to launch the Extension of Communication Healthcare Outcomes Augmentative Alternative Communication Program, or FOAAC. So we'll be talking a little bit about those programs in more detail. I wanted to let you know that it's through the advocacy of all of our staff that we have been able to um, develop these programs and it's through the mentor mentorship of Julie Gamrat that has really helped to build the programs at the Weissman Center. So now would be a good time for you to meet the staff. So I have um, been a speech pathologist at the Weissman Center and also served um, as the director since Julie uh, retired in 2019. Abigail Marks is the uh, also a speech pathologist and the clinical coordinator for CASC and then also the team lead for um, the communication development program. Sarah Marshall and Kat Cantor are both speech pathologists and team leads for both um, the AAC Partnership Program and ECHO AAC. Courtney Reed is our new occupational therapist and she has her doctorate in OT. She is also certified in assistive technology and seating and mobility, and we're excited to have her on board. Savannah Brittlebank Douglas and Jessica Ludwig are both speech pathology clinical fellows with our clinic, and um, they are very instrumental in supporting ECHO AAC in the partnership program as well. And I do want to uh, give a shout out to Jenna DiCarlo, who was a clinical fellow with us last year, and she um, was instr instrumental in developing the grant for the ECHO, P ECHO AAC program that launched this year. So the first program that I would like to talk about is the Communication Development Program. And this is the oldest of our AAC programs. Um, we understand it goes back to late 60s, early 70s, like I had mentioned. It was um, uh, starting at the Weissman Center um, when the Trace Center moved there and there was collaboration between the professionals in Dane County um, and Julie Gamrod and the Trace Center to uh, provide services to individuals who were in need of augmentative and alternative communication. And as it exists today, it is an interdisciplinary service where we provide consultation and technical support to individuals in the community. It used to be where we would provide a majority of our services in the home, but due to COVID, we did have to switch and um, are you using telehealth now where we're actually able to do WebEx, which works really well. It's, it's worked well for us. We're hoping we can continue after COVID um, precautions lift. Um, so we can actually provide both in-home and WebEx services for those individuals who need our support. The neat thing about the communication development program is it's focused as a team approach where we would be providing services to the individual and their team who they choose, whether it be family members, teachers, other uh, therapists, case managers, and we focus on a team approach of trying to help support the individual as they use their AAC um, in a variety of settings. It can be home, school, or community. The next program I would like to talk about is the Communication Aids and Systems Clinic. And that's CASC, and uh, you probably hear that acronym more often than not. 
CASC uh, provides interdisciplinary services, speech therapy and occupational therapy, where we provide evaluations and diagnostic therapy in order to help individuals secure a communication system that best meets their needs. And this is done through a feature match process. So when individuals come in for an assessment, they are able to look at our expansive library of communication systems that we have available in addition to different access methods. And it is through this feature matching process and through the provision of therapy that we're able to help individuals secure a device through their uh, insurance, hopefully, or other funding sources. Our next program is the Augmentative and Alternative Communication Partnership Program. And this was the brainchild of Kat Cantor and Sarah Marshall, who uh, were fortunate enough to move forward and request a grant and knowing that there needed to be some support to our coworkers and colleagues in the state of Wisconsin. And so this program was designed and is, was supported by a grant to mentor speech pathologists who work with individuals who require AAC. And so it's designed to mentor them um, through the um, AAC evaluation process and support through a securing a communication device for individuals. There are e-learning modules that are focused on advancing knowledge of AAC that the partners in the program would first take in order to learn more about the um, advanced high-tech AAC process. When they come in, the team would come in for an evaluation and there's collaborative feature matching occurring during the evaluation. So the partnership eval, which would occur at CASC, the Weissman Center, is typically 90 minutes. And that would include the entire team and everybody would be on the same page looking at everything that would work for that individual. And hopefully in that one session, we would be able to come up with a feature match that could eventually lead to a trial or a rental of a communication system for that individual. And the CASC team member is able to help with that rental process in um, supporting the paperwork and collaborating with the partner SLP during the process. And they're available for ongoing support, remote support um, after the evaluation. And then the final program I would like to talk about um, in, uh, for our AAC programs at the Weissman Center was just launched this year, and that's ECHO AAC. And ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And Project ECHO was developed as uh, a program to um, have online community and learning opportunities for individuals, um, community practitioners, um, who maybe are not in a specialty clinic and it helps uh, gather that information that they can get from the specialty clinic uh, professionals. And so the whole idea behind ECHO is um, a loop of communication between community professionals and um, specialists. And it was in January of this year, prior to COVID, that our team was fortunate enough to be able to go to the University of, Wisconsin, or University of Wyoming and participate in a Project ECHO training. And after having that training, we were able to come back. Jenna DiCarlo, Sarah Marshall, and Kat Cantor were instrumental in getting ECHO AAC started. And ECHO AAC is a um, program that offers, right now we're offering twice a month, online sessions that consist of didactic content delivered by field experts in the first half of the session. And then after that, it is, um, there are collaborative case-based studies. So what happens is we have the um, field experts coming in at the beginning, um, able to answer some questions. And then we have the collaborative case studies that are presented by our community partners and any other individuals who might be um, involved in this. And it's nice because it builds that uh, community of collaborative problem solving, which is the whole focus behind ECHO. 
And um, we want to be able to support individuals and providers as much as we can in the implementation of speech generating devices across all settings. So that was fast. <laughs> I wanted to just be able to thank you for listening. I know it was a lot of information, but I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about our program and um, give you some information prior to hearing from our other participants. So um, thank you again. And now we will take some time for some questions. Hey, Annette, this is Abby. Mm -hmm. There is for sure one question that I thought we could try to address, though we may not know the answer. So someone's asking about um, a child who is about to be going into uh, or is in her public school, but they're about to start doing some response to intervention or RTI type um, work. And so the question is, does an, RT, does an assistive technology assessment need to be a part of an RTI process? And I know I'm not super familiar with this, but my thought would be that even if it's not part of that process, there should be no reason why family can't ask for both, asking for an assistive tech or AAC eval in addition to the RTI processes. Does that sound right to you? That was going to be my exact response is um, even though it might not be a part of the process, you can definitely ask for that because I think it's import, uh, important to look at um, the need for assistive technology and see if there's anything that can um, be added or available in the school setting to help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's one thing that's tricky sometimes for us to answer given that we don't work in a school setting, but I think that's a great question to talk to the team about. Absolutely. I agree. Um, and then a follow-up question to that is about um, a child who is currently being provided virtual instruction by her learning educational assistant. Um, and it's talking about that data, some data reflects concerns about the appropriateness of current use of technology and that an assistive tech assessment wasn't completed as part of the IEP for this child. And so the question is, do we know of any resources available for the IEP team, or is there research available that highlights the need for these early individualized AT interventions? What I'm hoping is maybe we can get your contact information and get in touch with you about that, because I definitely think that there are resources out there and we would be able, want to be able to uh, provide that to you. So if we could get that information, and um, even um, you know, be able to connect with your team if um, that is something that you would like us to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another tip I could even say too is um, if you're the IEP team, each school district has access to what's called a CESA or a Cooperative Educational uh, Support Agency, I believe it stands for CESA. And those CESAs also sometimes have more supports for assistive technology. They might have loaning libraries, they might have a team who specializes in doing those assessments. Um, so you could talk to your IEP team about whether they are linked up with a CESA group that could help. Okay, let's see, I have another question here. Does your program see families outside of Dane County? And if so, how would someone refer? So um, as far as the, the CDP program, that is within Dane County, but we do provide services to individuals outside of Dane County um, at, the, at our CASC clinic at the Weissman Center. So um, you would refer, go through your physician, the primary um, care provider for the child or individual who um, may be in need of AAC, and then that person would make a referral to our clinic. And we can provide information on that as well. There should be information on our website as well. Absolutely. Um, it looks like there's actually some information too from, a, from a, an attendee, which is awesome, um, related to the school question. So it says, FYI, I am from DPI. If there is a possible disability, all disability related needs should be evaluated no matter what the possible disability area is. Um, so that's good to know that you can ask or you know, have, your, have an individual get that support through school no matter what their disability or their needs are. I also wanted to jump on, there was a question about the AAC partnership program working um, particularly with 
um, people within the Madison Metropolitan School District. Um, and while we do have relationships with both the um, assistive tech um, person as well as the AAC um, person for the district, um, if individual SLPs are interested, um, they can look at our program and enroll in those modules. And then that's something that we um, can address kind of as they email us um, in looking at that, that program and the appropriateness of it. That's great. And we have one more follow up too from Eva or Ava. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, Eva from DPI. If you make a request in writing to the IEP team, then the district must provide an evaluation. So for that question related to getting an AAC or AT eval, if you put it in writing with the school, that can help um, begin that process, which is great news. We have one more great comment too. Um, Dell says that one of the challenges they're experiencing is the assumption that assistive technology only means computers and it doesn't mean other low and no tech options. Um, so Annette or Kat, I wonder if you guys have any thoughts about ways to advocate for that. Well, I think that when looking at assistive technology, it might, because technology is in those words, um, it might uh, be commonly thought of for computers and not refer to low, no and low tech. But when we look at augmentative alternative communication, we do definitely take into consideration low tech. And so that would be something that you would want to find out from the assistive technology team is who is supporting AAC. Um, in that setting to be able to support any of those um, low tech or no tech options. Great. And then a follow up is about Wadi, which Wadi is an interesting uh, kind of situation right now, I think, right? Because some of the funding that used to support Wadi isn't necessarily there anymore. I don't know as much about that to make a comment. I don't know if you guys do. One of the things I can say um, is that they have recently, um, the Wisconsin DPI recently received um, a CARES grant and they have an AT Forward. Um, it's a community of practice. Um, and, oh, and it looks like Ava, or yeah. Ava already also <laughs> said that there is a universal design for learning forward. Um, and so I know that both of those um, are meeting regularly. They're talking about especially different things like making sure that virtual learning is accessible, um, thinking about closed captioning um, and all of those types of things, um, as well as providing uh, resources um, to be able to connect at a more um, national level. They have um, also memberships available for like the um, Assistive Technology Industry Association for um, I think applicable educators and things like that. So that's something that um, I would definitely check out. That's great information. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, we have about two more minutes before we switch over to our next presentation. It looks like there is a question about the wait time for an AAC evaluation, which is such a hard question if we could. I, I wish it was 930 and we could avoid this, but I think it's such a valid and important question. Um, unfortunately, because our programs are one of the only specialty centers in Wisconsin, along with a few other wonderful individuals that we've been lucky enough to partner with, it can be a much longer wait than we would like for people to get into the programs. Um, it's hard to give exact numbers um, for how long people wait, but I think the biggest, I think the most important thing to know is that in our programs, we use a very, um, intricate maybe I would call it triage process to look at the needs for every single individual and to try to identify any ways that we can move things forward more quickly. So for example, the AAC partnership program that Kat and Sarah have done an amazing job and Jenna, our previous clinical fellow and our current clinical fellows are doing a wonderful job, has been a way to try to create more partnerships and more access to services. So although our wait is much longer than we would like for it to be, um, we are just know that we're always working really hard to find ways to, to decrease that and get people the services they need as quickly as possible. Thank you guys. And I echo that Abby, I, whoops. No, go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, just the development of the two programs, the um, AAC Partnership Program and ECHO AAC have both been instrumental in helping um, reach out to uh, professionals throughout the state um, to be able to provide the AAC evaluations um, closer to home. And so um, that's been really helpful too. So it's nice to have that option. 
Awesome. So we'll have another um, opportunity for questions after Kat and Stasha's presentation. So let's go ahead and switch over to that. Yeah, so I'd like to introduce Kat, Catherine Cantor. She goes by Kat, of course. <laughs> and she's a speech pathologist in our clinic. And then Stasha Wilson is um, a user of assistive technology and part of our a part of the LENG program at um, the Weissman Center. So we're very excited to have them here today. Kat, are you muted? It looks like the audio, Teresa and Clark, is not quite working. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think I'm hearing anything. Sorry, everybody. It'll just take a second here, a little technical difficulty. I'm sure anyone here who has been involved with AAC in any ways is not, this is not new. <laughs> so no worries. <laughs> technical troubles can always come up. Hi everyone. So for our first day with the experts on AAC, we wanted to talk about a really hot topic right now, uh, connecting via virtual platforms when you're using augmentative and alternative communication. Uh, I wanted to start by saying that prior to COVID-19, um, our clinic was really not providing any teletherapy. Um, and so like many of you were really jumping in and learning alongside our clients and our families and teams to support them in this new world. So a little bit about us and who we'll be presenting today. Uh, my name is Kat and I'm a speech language pathologist at the University of Wisconsin Madison's Weisman Center. And I work in a variety of clinics um, in community-based settings where I focus pri primarily on augmentative and alternative communication or AAC, um, including working at the Communication Aids and Systems Clinic, in the Communication Development Program, and in our ALS clinic. And with me today, I'm lucky to have Sasha Wilson, um, who is one of our wonderful Wisconsin LEND trainees um, and is also an individual who uses AAC herself. Uh, later, when she gives us some of her wonderful tips on AAC and connecting over teletherapy, we are going to have her introduce herself a little bit more um, and give you some more information about her. So for today, we'll be talking briefly about some different ways we can use augmentative and alternative communication over virtual platforms, um, you know, just some different models for engaging. Uh, and we'll talk about some great tips for success using virtual therapy. And finally, we'll have some final thoughts from myself and from Stasha on how to support your individuals who are using AAC and their families and teams while we're in this virtual world. So, Let's just start with a brief discussion of the different ways that we can engage using AAC virtually. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us have had to pivot largely into this virtual world of connection and therapy and everything else that we were used to doing in person. At CASC, we found that with each of our clients and families, we're using a different model of kind of connecting than we were in the past to support each family's and each client's individual needs and skills. Rachel Nattle wonderfully summarizes kind of four main models in her presentation to Practical AAC, which I linked at the bottom of this slide. Um, in the direct model, we're really just providing therapy services to the child or the adult who's using AAC. And this is the most similar to an in-person session. So where you're directly working with that individual who is learning. We're having direct conversations, um, playing together, learning together, just having fun. In the coaching model, 
we're providing caregivers with specific feedback, either in real time as they're using that AAC device or after the fact with a video um, on how to really integrate that AAC device into their everyday life um, and what we can do to make that easier. In this consultative model, we're really meeting more with caregivers and other team members and less so with the individual who's using AAC themselves. Um, to really just continue to brainstorm ideas, troubleshoot what's going well and what's not going well, um, and really plan continued communication growth through shared goals and planning. And finally, in that hybrid approach, we're combining different aspects of all of those therapies, direct, coaching, and consultation, um, in order to support all of the needs of the individual, the family, and the team members. And so this is something that's really flexible um, and that we're really encouraging all families and all school and outpatient providers to recognize that there isn't just one way to connect virtually. There are lots of different ways that we can do that and still support individuals who are using AAC. So when we look at all of these different models, oftentimes what we get a question about is, well, which model works best? Um, and overall, there really is no one-size-fits-all approach, and we found that each unique client and family really benefits from talking through all these options with their team and deciding on the best model for them. In our experience so far, we found that that direct model, doing one-on-one -on -one therapy, really having those um, direct conversations can work best really well for clients who can really maintain attention during a session. Even if it's just for a little bit, for 10 or 15 minutes, that can be a really great way to still have that direct connection. Um, additionally, we found that having a caregiver who's willing to kind of make sure everything's set up, the AAC device, the technology, um, that can really help um, in this direct model. And finally, the direct model without any other model can be really beneficial for individuals who already have their AAC system. So um, they've had an AAC evaluation and the team feels really confident in what that individual is using to communicate. Um, and so they aren't completing trials or there maybe aren't a lot of questions about that. For the consultative model, um, this can be really helpful for families and teams who have a really established system um, and who are fairly knowledgeable about how to edit on their device or support the child or their family member who's using AAC. Um, it's really great to use this consultative model to build on what we're currently seeing as being successful um, and really expand beyond that communication that they're already doing. The coaching model is an excellent fit for anyone who is still not sure kind of what AAC device is gonna fit best for them. Um, you know, or if we're trying to customize it and get it to be right so that it's that most effective and efficient device for an individual to be using. Um, it really makes sure that our family members and our team members are really engaged in that process and are able to really actively share their thoughts on the benefits and the challenges of different systems as we try them. It can also be a really great fit um, when the caregiver who's supporting the individual or the team members are uncertain about technology and different teaching techniques. And we really want to make sure that we're practicing together and everybody's feeling confident as we go forward. Finally, I think the model that uh, we find ourselves most often using is this hybrid model. Um, it's a really great fit for individuals who can maintain attention even for the tiniest bit of time. Um, five to 10 minutes is great uh, so that you can do that direct therapy time, but then it also still allows for a lot of time to connect with the team and with the caregivers to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're supporting everybody's ongoing needs and questions. And so now that we've talked a little bit about kind of some of those models and different ways you can engage in teletherapy, Let's talk about some specific tips for success to support really great interactions that are happening virtually. One of the best things you can do, and always my first recommendation for any family or any team who is starting in um, this new virtual therapy world or new virtual communication, um, is to set expectations. 
um, about what that session is going to look like. I found that doing a pre-planning visit either via phone or email can be really helpful to set up some clear expectations of what the session is going to look like, what we're going to need, um, and how early we should plan to get things ready, when the individual who's using the AAC device will need to be on, and when it's okay if they go. Um, again, I really love Rachel Nattle's explanation of these different expectations here of, you know, we're going to listen, we're going to teach, I'm going to coach you through some things, and we're going to recap at the end. Having those clear expectations can really be a game changer. Another way to set expectations is to have a really clear structure um, for each session that you're going to have or for every kind of communication that you're going to have. So setting an agenda um, or a schedule of what you can expect can be really helpful, not only um, for the family to prepare, but also for that individual who's using an AAC device to prepare. Um, if they need to have sentences that are more prepared or things like that, it gives them a little bit more time. Um, for example, I really love to start with direct therapy. Um, so I love to start by directly working with that individual who's using an AAC device while I have their attention. Um, and they're engaged. And then I like to move more to that coaching and consultation at the end, reflecting on what went well during that time when I was working directly with the client. Um, is that similar to what you're seeing when you're working with the client um, and all of those pieces? I found this formula for choosing some target words with really repeatable activities before the session, modeling where that word is, leading an activity to show how I would model that word, and then coaching that family member through doing that has been really helpful. Um, and I always love to wrap up the session by talking about what went well, um, what questions still remain, and kind of what we can practice before next session. So for example, this might look like um, me choosing a word or a few words that I want to target during the session. I really want to focus on modeling these words. Um, so I might model this on the device by using screen mirroring on my computer or by sharing a video beforehand. And then I might model this word in this example I've chosen here while I'm reading a book, Polar Bear, Polar Bear. So every time that what do you hear comes up, I'm going to model that word on the device and encourage the caregiver to do the same. Um, then after I've done that once through, I'd encourage the caregiver to choose okay, are we going to read Polar Bear, Polar Bear again? Or should we try a different activity and read Old McDonald and talk about which animals we're hearing? Um, after that, then I like talking about how can we um, decide where we're going to use here in this next week before I see you again? Um, and really make sure that the parents are taking ownership or caregivers are taking ownership over that. Um, and really making sure that they're contributing um, to put in their own goals for that. Another really big tip um, for success that um, often combats technical issue barriers um, is to practice first before a session. Practice, practice, practice. Um, I often like to set up a test room with families um, if time allows so that they're able to play around with some of the features. Um, I know that it seems like a lot of us are using different platforms. Some of us are using similar ones, Zoom, Google Meet. Um, but everyone has a little bit of its nuances. And so being able to play around those with those features and feel more comfortable um, without also having to juggle having their, um, their child or um, the child who's using AAC with them can be really helpful so that they feel more comfortable with that technology first. Also, one of the things that I love to use is that there have been so many resources, um, videos, quick reference guides, everything that has been distributed since the start of COVID-19. And so definitely always fall back on these free resources, share them with families, share them with teams, so that everybody's feeling comfortable and confident with that technology. One of the best evidence-based strategies we have for teaching an individual to use an AAC device is called aided language stimulation or modeling. And essentially it's this process of using an AAC device to say and show words as you're saying them with your verbal speech. So just like I showed in that last example, when I was picking that word here, 
every time I'm reading polar bear, polar bear, what do you hear? I'm touching here on the device to show how I might say that. And in doing this, you're really teaching that person who uses AAC how to find words and how to communicate concepts on their device. However, uh, we've found that this process can be more difficult when you add in this extra piece of there also needs to be this video technology and how can I see what the individual screen looks like. Um, and so one of the things I really love to do is start the session by modeling where to find vocabulary. Um, so really make sure that I'm telling caregivers that I just want them to focus on just a few vocabulary words or just a few sentences um, to really be modeling, even if I am modeling more. Um, I also download all of the free versions of the communication software, things like Snap for First, Empower, Chat Editor, Polo Protocol, um, to be able to model and share from my computer screen and talk through those things with the caregiver. I also really love using visual cues um, to help families uh, find vocabulary on the device, as well as using built-in features that can help you find different words if you're looking for them. And so on this slide, I just have some examples of some visual cues that I might use. Um, so if I am sharing my screen, if I'm looking at this example in the upper left, I put a dark black border around the words that I want to target for a, for a session that I'm going to be modeling a lot go, stop, up, and down. Um, and by doing that, I'm really highlighting to that individual who's using the device as well as to their family members where we can find that on the device and how we can get there. On the bottom picture, you'll see that I've changed the color of some of those topics. Um, again, this might just be to show really easily how we're going to find these topics and where we need to go to get to them. And then in that upper picture, I'm showing some of those built-in features. Um, this is called the Vocabulary Builder within the Empower. And basically what it does is it will just hide all the vocabulary that's maybe not relevant to a specific conversation topic or activity, um, just to promote it being a little bit easier for families, for the individuals to find the words they're looking for. Um, and then of course, at the end, we're always showing all the words again so that the individual can explore and say things outside of just that activity. On this slide, I put in um, a link to a video that shows actually how to find a lot of words on different softwares. So a lot of the different communication software have these uh, features called word finder, where you can just type in the word that you're looking for and it'll either lead you there or show you the pathway of symbols that you need to take to get to that symbol. Um, so this can be super helpful for families and for teens if we're looking for words, if we want to add more words on, but we're not sure if they're already on the system. All of this can be really helpful. And I won't go through that whole video, um, but that's there for you if you would like it. Um, another really great resource we found for modeling is that there are a lot of really good videos out there that show different types of tips. So um, show how to use aided language stimulation or how to use wait time to encourage more communication. And really watching these videos um, with your team members, with your family can be really helpful and a really great way to start the discussion on what went well in that video. What did we think how do you think that applies to um, the individual that we're supporting who's using AAC? And what can we do to make it even better? Another um, big tip that I have um, is that I often have families um, fill out a reinforcement inventory. So um, this I borrow from our board certified behavior analysts who are wonderful. Um, but it helps you get an idea of what's super motivating for an individual. So is it music? Is it videos? Is it movement? Toys? Social play? Jokes? What's going to be the most engaging thing that I can do to make our conversation really exciting and really maximize your attention? I also love to plan sessions um, during times of day if possible when I know that the individual will be maybe confined to a 
specific area. So if um, it, that meal time that they're going to be um, at the kitchen table, or if we're outside and they're on a swing and we know they're going to be in their swing, really making sure that we're, we're pulling on some of those natural environments too to help us really make sure we're maximizing that attention. Another tip for success um, can be how can I access technology? Um, a lot of individuals I think have this question of, I don't have an AAC device, um, and so how can I help my, my family member, my student, my client who's using, um, who needs communication but doesn't have access to it right now? Um, and my biggest piece of advice is to talk to the vendors. Um, you can, I, on the next couple of slides, I have a lot of different links um, to free resources from vendors that are um, really helpful when you're looking for different technology. Um, many of the vendors can send out free trials and have free low-tech uh, options available on their website too for you to just print and play with. Um, also consider partnering with the centers that might be able to do some in-person sessions. Um, finally, if your um, individual is in a school, the Assistive Technology Lending Center out of um, the Cooperative Educational State Agency, the CISA 2, has a lot of really free um, loan AAC device and other AT equipment. So if you're in the schools, you're able to get that and really trial it at home. And so on this slide, I have linked a number of great AAC resources that currently exist across the company to really support access to that technology, um, both for kind of that assessment, you know, I don't know what's going to be right, but then also on this slide, um, a lot of ideas for different activities, um, different lesson plans, different communication boards, ideas for ways to integrate it into your daily routines. All of these are free and really easy for you to use. And so, now just some final thoughts as we're thinking about um, connecting and using AAC or virtual platforms. So my final tip before I turn it over to Sasha, the bottom line is that if you're not having fun with communication, then your student, your family member likely isn't either. Um, communication should always be fun. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, I found myself very frustrated and flustered and overwhelmed almost every day. Um, but I also saw that reflected in my clients, my families, my teams. You know, as we were all getting used to this new world, it was really difficult for us. Um, but I realized too that as soon as I relaxed and I remembered that I was just there to share in the joy of communication and being a social partner and a social connection. I started to see a really big change. And so remembering that you should always be having fun and laughing and really just enjoying that communication. Next, please be kind uh, to yourself and your students and your family and your team. You know, we're all learning and we're all trying our best in a very not normal world right now. Um, I have days, I have weeks um, where every single one of my sessions does not go the way that I plan. Um, I'm just, and I feel like, oh no, I, I don't know how to do this. But I think that that's okay because then there are other weeks where I find that I get little glimmers of hope and growth. Um, and that's really what it's all about is again that social connection and that joy of communication and moving towards something better. And finally, my last tip is that you can do this. Um, and I know that it sounds really cheesy, but I really believe in each and every person who's watching this today, um, even if you don't believe in yourself right now. You know, being here and, a, and learning about um, AAC and how you can help support individuals who aren't communicating via speech um, is really showing how much you care about clients and your families and your teams, and um, that's really half the battle. And so know that all of us are here as a team and that we all are here to believe in you and that you can do this. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sasha to tell you a little bit more about herself and give you some of her tips from her perspective. Hi, I am Anastasia Wilson, and I am a mentoring me. 
I view myself as an artist first, and I view my disabilities as just side notes. They are issues that I need to handle so I can follow my passion for art and hopefully become a well-known artist. When my first physical therapist in grade school noticed that I had the most control over my leg and my head, my father started to make my head sticks so I could create 2D art. There were many modifications to the head sticks over the years to assist me to pursue my dreams. I have some tips for working with AAC users. If you are teleconference with them first, have patience. Not only we are communicating through the device, if they are older and more independent, they are probably controlling their computer with their communication device also. Everything just takes more time for us. It is a good idea to have a support person to set the technology up for the first time and make sure the person can access it easily. The support person might want to walk them through how to use the technology just to make sure they know how and if they can use the tool. It might be a good idea if the support person leaves their number because we all know technology loves to break down. I have a love, hate relationship with my assistive technology. I can't live without it, and I can't throw that zebra on it. My mom set me up with Zoom so she could help me with my laptop. Plus, I think she likes to peek in on me from Chicago. My fourth tip is to listen to the individual and their family. They know their kid, and the person knows their body and how it works. When I was in grade school, I had a liberator for a communication device. It worked well except for its optical head pointer. I would get so frustrated. There is nothing more frustrating than needing to say something and you have a really cool machine that is supposed to speak for you, but it is not working. My dad made a head stick for art making and I figured out that the head stick was perfect for pressing the buttons on my communication device. However, my speech language pathologist didn't agree with me that it was a brilliant idea. We had many fights about that. I wish she was more flexible to using different tech options. We are great friends now, and we laugh about the old days. I'll pass it back to Kat. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you so much for sharing all of those tips, I think. Um, it's helpful for us all to hear all of those different pieces, especially from your perspective, um, because you, you live it and you know what works and what doesn't. So just on the next couple of slides, I just had some references, as well as some additional resources on great presentations for how to really have success using AAC virtually. Um, but right now, we can turn it over for questions if there are any. All right, so I saw a number of questions come in in the chat box. Um, Stasha, I am wondering if you want to, there you are. <laughs> um, if you wanted to prepare an answer, um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, how you advocated for um, some of the, the assistive technology or the AAC um, that you needed in school. So um, while you prepare that, is it okay if I answer another question? Okay. So um, another question that came in really quick that was um, a little bit more technical was um, how do I share and box the words like I did? Um, so 
I do often do it by um, downloading the free versions of the communication software on my computer. And then like within Zoom or um, Google Meet, I share my screen. Um, and it's pretty easy to just adjust some of those settings to either um, make a thicker border on a button um, or to change the color of it. Um, and so that can be a pretty um, simple way to get that through. There are also other ways where you can um, screen share. I actually might call on Abby um, to talk about how you're able to share directly from a device, like if you're able to share from um, an iPad. Let's see if she's here. Kat, I actually don't think that attendee, were you talking about it, the person who asked the question or someone else? I was talking about someone asked if you're doing it via um, using it through the computer or if there's a way you can do it through the device itself as well. Gotcha. To share the Thanks screen. And so I was just wondering if you could talk about like if you use an iPad, um, the function that you can use for like mirroring. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I was like, sorry. <laughs> I totally missed the question. Um, so I often will use my computer itself. So I'll have um, downloaded the software that matches the um, what's on uh, an in individual's device. And then I will just use the screen share within the software most often. I think that's the, the most seamless way to do it. Um, sometimes I will use my iPad um, and actually, you, so there are ways where you can use what's called AirPlay and share what's on your screen into a computer, but it creates another layer of technology where if your internet connection isn't really strong, there can be a lot of glitches and a lot of technical difficulties. Um, so I do advise using the software on your on your computer if you can. Most softwares or most communication, most of the robust communication apps have a Windows version that can be downloaded. Any, most of them have a free version that everyone can download. And then speech language pathologists can often use their ASHA number to also get more access to some of those tools for using within therapies. So the best way to find out what's available for those things would be to look at the name of the vendor on your student or client's device, like who manufactures it and reach directly out to them. And they can let you know if there's a free version you can download um, or if they can give you a copy of the software to use within your therapies. Stasha, I wonder if you're ready to share your answer. Not yet. Okay, totally fine. So as you are still typing, I'm going to kind of start taking that one too. So um, I know one of the, the big questions was um, about, sorry, I want to make sure I have the wording right. Um, about initial AT assessment protocols and those types of things. There are a lot of resources available. Um, I know that there's a control alt shift in Michigan, um, which is a group who provides a really comprehensive resource for AT assessment and AAC. Um, and I think it's just important to make sure that um, you're advocating for your family member um, or for your student on what kind of can be most helpful. Um, I think that it can, that AT assessment and, and AAC um, initial assessment can also help guide some of that development of like, which kind of model should we be using for teletherapy? Um, you know, I think that's a really great question and a really great discussion to have with your whole team um, to make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page in that respect. Um, another question that came in was, do all platforms work well with AAC, Zoom, Teams, and WebEx, or are there ones that work better? Um, I can say that from my experience personally, um, they all work a little bit differently. Um, <laughs> I don't know that there's necessarily one that's better than another. Um, I know that um, I've had more success with Zoom, but we also, through UW Health, um, we use a specific software called Bidwio, and AAC works well through there as well. Um, 
I think that if there are any issues, it's always great to just revisit some of those help videos um, and really talk to your vendors. So look at who makes that device that your student's working with and talk with them about um, any issues that you're having because they've been doing a ton of virtual therapy and been helping a ton of people virtually and can offer a lot of really great solutions on how to really creatively um, make sure that you're able to use that virtually. You ready, Stasha? Okay. I'm gonna see if I can unmute you, hold on. I had also a speech language pathologist who advocate for the best assistive technology for me. When I got older, I had to practice standing up for myself. It took time for me to get the hang of it. Sasha, I think that's such a good point that um, it's so helpful if you can have at least a one team member kind of on your side and on your team ready to advocate and then really helping to empower you and learn those skills yourself because like you said, you are an, excellent, an awesome advocate. Um, so now I think we are going to pause with the questions for there and turn it over to Abby and our wonderful community panelists. And just a reminder, um, as Abby um, facilitates the panel, that um, there will be time at the end to answer questions and that also um, that uh, poll at the very end will pop up at, after the uh, panel is done. Awesome. This is going to be great. So can I go ahead and ask um, Landon, I'm going to send you a message to start your video if that's okay. And I see Lindsay and Becky and Stasha are all ready. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to give a real brief introduction. Um, I'm sorry, I've taken the liberty to do so on your behalf, but just so we can move through quick intros and then into the questions we have already from people, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so today we are we are so excited to have Landon, who is one of our longtime clients in the Weissman Center AAC programs. Um, he's also one of our great friends and he is an avid hunter and was kind enough to give up his Saturday morning this fall with us. So we're so glad you're here. Lindsay is the sibling of an individual who uses AAC to communicate and she has been an amazing advocate for her sister throughout their growing up together. So we're excited about her unique perspective as well. Becky is a parent of a child who uses AAC and from her therapist, Sarah, we know that Becky has done an incredible job of navigating the world of AAC to become just an exceptional teacher for her son. And we can't wait for her to answer some of these questions as well. And then Stasha, who is our last, but definitely not least panelist, uh, she came to us first as a client in our CAST program, but over these past years, she has become involved at the Weissman Center in so many ways as an advocate and a mentor, and most recently as a trainee in the LEND Leadership Development Program. And so we can't thank you all enough for being here today. I'm going to go ahead and jump into some of the questions that we already have for our panelists. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll start with one person kind of to answer the question first, but then afterwards, anyone else who wants to jump in, feel free to um, kind of jump in afterwards and give more input. So Stasha, is it okay if I come to you first for the first question? <laughs> okay, great. This one is one I think you, I've heard you descri describe and talk about well uh, as a mentor. What is one thing about your, and then for others, your family members experience with communication strategies that you would like to share with other people? Kind of one gem of information. Is it working? I can definitely go to Lindsay or Becky first too and come back. Yeah, okay. Lindsay or Becky, would one of you wanna jump in and talk about one thing you tell people about your guys' experience? I'm actually gonna jump in real quick, Abby. Um, Sarah had mentioned that she's not able to see everybody on the panel. Oh. Um, okay. So I don't know. Yeah, let's see. Thank you for jumping in. That's good that. Um. I wonder if we sweet if we switch this to speaker view. Um, Annette, can you talk again and we'll see if it switches to you? 
Uh, yes. I'm actually, are you seeing me right now as I talk? I do see you as the big, the main screen. Okay. What you see, Kat? Yeah, that's what I see. Okay, great. And now it changed to you when you talk. So I think what'll happen now is the panelists will show along the top. And then as one person answers, hopefully they'll become the big person on the screen. Okay. okay. So the panel showing at the top right now, is that correct? That's what I see, yes. Okay, got it, thanks. Oh, and Clark gave some feedback too. Um, if you're not seeing the person who's speaking as the big picture, um, you can go to the top, if you, in the, in the big part of the Zoom screen where you see our pictures, if you go up, there's a little um, button that says view in the upper right corner, and you can change to speaker view or gallery view. Gallery will show all the pictures at once, and speaker will show a big one for who's talking plus the other smaller on the top. So hopefully that helps everyone see um, what they're hoping to see. <laughs> and Becky, I saw that you unmuted. Do you mind talking with, to us about the first question? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the one thing that we've learned, so my son is four years old. Um, we have had his uh, speech generating device for less than a year. So you should know that I'm very new to this. My family is very new to this. Um, but we are finding out that Isaac uses so many ways to communicate. He uses his talker um, incredibly well. He's blown us away with everything that he's been able to do and learn with that. But he also uses his voice. He verbalizes um, full words. He uses approximations. He is incredibly, um, uh, just his facial expressions can tell us so much. And we are just learning how important it is to um, be attentive to and to honor all of his communication. Um, not just asking him, use your talker, tell us on your talker. Um, he, he's got so many ways to communicate. He is uh, multilingual in that way. So I think it's just so important to honor all communication from um, anyone you're working with, any family member, things like that. That's fantastic advice. Lindsay, go ahead. Hey, um, so uh, my younger sister, Jenna, um, who's 19 now, has been going to Casket the Weissman Center for uh, since she was very young. Um, and one of the strategies that I think I learned perhaps from seeing sort of the uh, modeling that was done at Casks that then I found to be really helpful um, at home was to um, have what Jenna and I would call iPad conversations in which both of us would exclusively use AAC to communicate with one another. Um, and I think that was something on the one hand that Jenna really enjoyed, um, so something we kept doing, um, but also I think it helped give me a few things. So one was a deeper appreciation for um, how hard Jenna works to build sentences on her device, um, to slow down perhaps like my pace during communicating with her, um, and also to really have a much more comprehensive understanding of what language um, Jenna has access to. Um, and so at this point in time, Jenna doesn't use um, spelling or predictive word features on her device. She uses primarily um, pre-programmed words or phrases um, that she can string together and build sentences with. Um, but knowing what's there and what's not helps me understand sort of how I can be a better communication partner with her. Um, also when she maybe is using a more, less traditional combination of, of words for me to understand why she might be doing that and think more creatively about that. Um, and then also for where I can step in um, and also identify language that I could um, program into her device. Um, and so, for example, I'm, I'm nine years older than her, so I may not know the slang as well as she would like, but I would try to you know, put in some slang or things so that she could communicate with her peers in language that they might be using or things that are relevant with our family um, and sort of customize that a bit more. So I think that was um, something really becoming incredibly familiar with her device was really helpful for me as a strategy. That's great advice, I love that. Sasha, it looks like you muted again, but Lan, and I see you getting your hand ready. Do you have a message ready? Okay, go ahead. Okay. 
to see my body language and facial expressions. You need to be patient and allow me a chance to respond. Not just one communication strategy works. I use many different ways to talk. Just like I am persistent and don't give up trying to tell people what I want to say, I need people to stick with me and to try and figure out what I am saying. That's really great advice, Landon, talking about, you know, explaining how you communicate and asking people to really be a good partner, right? Listen and wait. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thumbs up. Okay, Stasha, do you have anything that you want to add about um, one thing you, you uh, share with people about your communication? Looks like you're getting ready. Thank you. The biggest thing is just to have patience. Absolutely. It sounds like you and Landon are on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much. And actually, that's a really good segue into the next question that's on here. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, Lindsay or since uh, Landon and Stasha both gave us a little information about this and feel free to add more, but Lindsay or Becky, would you have anything to add about how you explain or describe your family members' communication strategies to others who aren't familiar with it? Sure, um, I can go. Uh, so typically um, I'd explain that Jenna primarily uses a touch-based um, speech generating device um, to communicate with others. Um, and so I, uh, help explain that that contains some pre-programmed phrases and things that she'll need to build um, to communicate her message. Um, but then there are also, um, as everyone else was, was discussing, a number of other strategies beyond her AAC device. Uh, that she, her high tech device that she uses, um, such as physical gestures, so raising her hands for yes or no, um, in order to communicate. So sort of um, to, to have patience as, as she builds those different things, but then uh, that she'll use a combination of techniques to, to communicate everything. Um, I did see that there is a question about the um, device that my son used, so I'll mention for some reason I'm having trouble typing um, in the chat window. Um, Isaac uses a, a Nova chat with the touch chat app. Um, and um, yeah, so that's what he uses. As far as explaining Isaac's communication with others, um, I have found that um, we've, especially since Isaac is new to it, I think what we've noticed with other family members, um, friends that we use it with, I think a lot of people often think he's just playing on his talker. Um, I've had, heard people refer to it that he's getting a lot of screen time. Um, so we've become advocates for him in that he is, he's, um, an emerging communicator and, uh, one good way to explain it is he's kind of babbling. He's exploring with his sounds. He's learning his device. And one challenge that Isaac has that other kids don't is that when he is, um, using his device to speak with us is that he has a lot of distractors. I mean, he has, um, what, 60 or so buttons on his device to choose from. And if he chooses, if he's telling us something he wants to play, um, all of a sudden, maybe he wanted to read a book, but now he's like, oh yeah, there's bubbles. I could play bubbles. Maybe I want to do that. Or wait, there's an iPad on that page. That's better. <laughs> like, um, so his, he's still learning his device. Um, he's oh. his sounds and, um, there's there's some unique challenges with the device and he's a little guy so I um, just encourage everyone to give him grace <laughs> with that. Absolutely and I see Stasha is nodding along to almost everything you're saying so I think you're not alone in that and Landon's giving a thumbs up so I think um, those are such good points that kind of you know, being a good that's you're representing how you're being a good advocate too for his communication needs, which I just love. Stasha, do you have anything or Landon, do you have anything to add about I explain to people that I have the latest assistive technology to help me to lead an active life. My mom says I have the coolest toys. This computer that you see me talking through is my communication device. It tracks my eyes to select the buttons. Is that cool? 
or what? So cool. And I'm glad you talked about that too, Stasha, that you use your eyes to communicate, which I think just shows that there are lots of different ways to help support an individual to communicate. And Landon, you touched on this too, that people should give you time and know that you can communicate. They just need to be kind of supportive of the way you're doing it. I see you unmuted. Go ahead if you have something to add. Understand everything people are saying to me. I can communicate pretty well with my facial expression, some signing, and using some vocal calls to get others' attention. I am also pretty good with my Proloquo to go app on my iPad and finding things to say. I am also writing books about my family and hunting experiences. I also communicate with my service dog, Ursa. We had to be the trainers for her as she has learned to listen to the voice from my iPad too. We had to get a speaker to mount on my wheelchair so that she could hear me. Once she could hear me, it has been great. She is an amazing dog. That's so awesome, Landon, that you trained your, your dog and that she understands and uses your device. I love that. And you and Becky talked a little bit about the same thing, that you have lots of different ways you communicate. Um, and so does Becky's son, which is so important. Um, that's actually another good set. You guys are so good at setting me up for the next question. Um, Cause you talked a little bit about what works well, but also what doesn't work so well. So the next question is what are some of the challenges you've experienced with using AAC? And I'm wondering if I can go Lindsay to you first on, on this one. Sure. Um, so I think one thing um, that sort of just in the setup of it is that Jenna doesn't always have access to her AAC device. So for, for Jenna, um, she's able to use it well if she's sitting in her wheelchair, standing in her stand or somewhere that has a tray and the support that she needs for her arm. Um, but if she's lying on her bed or something, um, it's not possible for her to use her, that device. And so I think sort of balancing, knowing that there'll be times when um, that tech, higher technology option is not available is something that um, is a challenge. Um, I think also, uh, you know, fortunately, so right now Jenna is using the touch chat application on an iPad. Um, and I found that to be uh, pretty accessible as a, you know, non-trained professional in terms of editing and things, but some of the previous um, software or devices that she was using um, were difficult to edit. And so I think that that's a challenge as somebody who wants to support um, uh, their communication as much as possible. Um, yeah, and I think also um, for, for Jenna, sometimes um, she does get frustrated if the language that she wants to use perhaps is not available on her device or we're not understanding her properly, um, which is to completely understandable. And I think navigating that in the best way as possible is a challenge that we face. Such great points, absolutely. Becky, do you have anything you would add about challenges? Uh, yeah, I think the biggest challenge and um, something that I didn't necessarily expect when we started our journey um, with Isaac's AAC is it is an incredible amount of work. Um, this has been a journey for mm -hmm. entire family, which includes myself, Isaac, my husband, um, and Isaac's three-year-old brother. So it's it's a lot of work. We are realizing that modeling is so important. Waiting is so important. Um, Isaac needs time. Um, and sometimes it can be a challenge, especially with a two-year-old that wants to go, go, go. Um, we need to give him real and meaningful opportunities to practice, which means being mindful and um, taking his device wherever we go. Um, and trying to give him opportunities to practice with it as much as possible and as feasible. Um, and like I said, we're just beginning our journey and it's, it's going to be a lot of work and it's hard work, but it is so worth doing because I think um, giving Isaac communication is going to be his biggest asset moving forward as he grows. That's amazing and so true. Landon, can I come to you next for this one? What's, do you have any other things to chat about related to challenges you've experienced? In a small town, there have been many kind people along the way with good hearts. I seem to be a trailblazer being nonverbal in my district. There have not been many other students like me and staff have had to learn alongside of me. Everyone has meant well, but it has been a rough road at times. 
It takes a long time to get my ideas and thoughts typed into my device. By the time I get my ideas typed in, other people are already talking about the next thing. Yes, that's such a good point, Landon. I think you are showing really well too that you've come prepared with some, some things you knew you wanted to share. And that's such a good point that kind of having things ready ahead of time is one way to be able to communicate quickly. But then there are times where you just need people to slow down and wait because you have really important things to contribute to and it might just take you a little bit longer to get it ready. Absolutely. Dasha, what would you add? The biggest challenge with talking through a communication device is people rushing me to finish my sentences especially when they are angry at me and they act if they know what I'm going to say and already said it, but it wasn't what I was going to say. I learned to take a couple of deep breaths and turn my sound off to finish my message when that happens. However, my greatest pet peeve is when people talk, baby talk to me. I would get so angry because I felt as if the person was undermining my intelligence. It took many years for me to realize it was saying more about their intelligence than mine. Stasha, that's a great point. And what a good tip too about if, you know, what can you, like you said, you turn the sound off when you're composing the message to try to have people not guess or interpret for you. I think that's a wonderful tip for people to think about, you know, not only what you can do as a use, as a person who's communicating through AAC, but how can we educate partners too? Do you ever have an experience where you tell people like, stop guessing? Or, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so good that you are such a strong advocate and you say what you need. There was a great follow-up question in the chat too, actually, Lindsay, something that you said spurred this question. Um, Dell is wondering when you're orient, and but everybody can answer this question. When you're orienting and training new or unfamiliar people to your sister's communication needs, do you rely on verbal sharing or do you have any type of portfolio or tools describing the communication landscape? Um, so, Personally, um, I think I will start primarily with, with verbally, but I do think that I would encourage somebody to especially watch um, my sister use her device. And so rather than standing maybe across from her, standing next to her so they can see the screen and, and watch as she navigates the different pages, I think that that's something that um, more quickly maybe gives a new communication partner some information about um, how Jenna will communicate. Um, and also uh, similar to what Stasha was saying, maybe encourages them to hold off and uh, let her see that she's trying to do uh, change something or perhaps if she makes a mistake that she's trying to delete a word and replace it with what she meant. Um, so I think uh, that's one of the strategies that I, I typically would, would use, yeah. That's great advice. Does anyone else have things to add about kind of, you know, ways that you help teach other people about your communication? I think for us, um, a big thing right now is helping our family members to be comfortable with Isaac's talker and his communication. And um, for example, like with my parents, they don't feel super comfortable with it. Um, so we're just trying to teach them that um, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to try it. And um, just, it's okay. It's okay if you don't get it quite right because that's just teaching Isaac that it's okay to try and make mistakes and learn from them and um, keep, keep moving on his communication journey. That's amazing advice. Absolutely. And it goes with what Stasha said about giving grace and, and what both she and Landon have said about patience too. I love that. 
So I know we're getting close. We're, we're at our end time that was planned. Um, but if, if there are two really wonderful questions that I'd love to ask before we sign off. Um, so I'm hoping that's okay. And if, if attendees need to sign off, know that this is being recorded and you come, you can come back and watch too at the end. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just ask these last two questions, if that's okay. One question came in through the chat. Um, this person is a healthcare provider and is wondering, is there any insight you have on ways we can make a clinical visit easier for someone who's using AAC and what things can healthcare providers be cognizant about during those encounters or be aware of? Um, Becky, can I actually come to you first on this one? Um, sure. <laughs> we, Isaac actually had a, a, a visit yesterday at um, UW Children's Hospital and uh, brought his device along. Um, for him, since I'm, he's a little guy and I'm still with him, um, I'm able to be a strong advocate for him, but I think it's important for us, um, even while he's little, to bring that along and make sure he has that option available to communicate with people if he wants to use that. Um, as far as um, using that to communicate information with his providers, we're not quite there yet, but, um, but we want to make that our practice. Absolutely. I love that. And I love that you're thinking about starting early and helping him kind of learn ways that he can effectively communicate about his own health care and desires. I love that. Lindsay, have you had experiences with this with your sister? Yeah, um, I mean, some of the things I can think of offhand are um, that it might be helpful if some of the initial, uh, it depends on what uh, appointment she's going to, but perhaps they will have her get on, you know, the a table or something where she's not able to use um, her communication device and answer questions at that point in time. And so that perhaps adjusting sort of the formatting of, of when you might be asking her things um, to make sure that that occurs in a time that she's more likely to be able to, to reply um, would be really helpful. Um, and I don't know of a case in which any of her healthcare providers have done this yet, um, but if there are certain questions that they intend to ask, um, perhaps now with things like my chart, sending those ahead of time might be really helpful um, because she could um, prepare answers um, or we could ensure that she has the, the right language on her device to be able um, to respond. Um, I think that sometimes just in the moment um, she hasn't necessarily been able to, and I think it would be really great if, if she could work towards that, yeah. What great advice, I love that idea of sending ahead the questions. Landon, are you ready to talk a little bit about this? Mom or dad usually speak for me at appointments, but I always have my device with me. They ask me to interrupt if they are saying something that I don't agree with. I love that. That's such a great approach too, because your mom and dad know you so well, and you guys have probably talked about the important things ahead of time. So that can make things faster, but making sure that they are including you and the doctor is including you is so important and that you have the opportunity to jump in if anything's not being represented right. That's awesome. Stasha, how about you? What are your experiences with healthcare providers? Anything to add? Not right now? Okay. Sounds good. This next question, I think you'll definitely um, have some good advice on. And Landon, I'm hoping I can actually come to you first on this one. Um, this, is the, this is the question about what have been your experiences or concerns about the transition to adulthood and thinking about as you're getting older. Oop. And you're still muted on the, on the video chat here. <laughs> Thank you. excited to own my land and possibly be a hunting outfitter. My concern is that my parents haven't bought the land yet. I found a lot of great properties, but my dad always has an excuse of why we shouldn't buy that land. Also, I am wondering what job I can have to earn money for my dream land. Finding a job is something I wonder about. That's amazing, Land, and I love your plan. And I think you're asking all the right questions about what you can be doing to prepare for that. That's amazing. Lindsay, I know that um, Jenna has recently um, moved through the transition from kind of childhood to adulthood. Do you have any advice or thoughts about that? 
Yeah, um, so as you said, yeah, Jenna uh, graduated high school about uh, a bit over a year ago and so is now in this sort of transition phase. Um, and I think one of the things that we've been thinking a lot as, as you have as well about her interacting with a lot, uh, a more diverse set of communication partners in different settings as she goes out into the community more, either when she's trying out potential different jobs um, or going, um, we've been trying to, you know, actively try to go to more stores, well, prior to COVID, uh, go to more stores and things to, to allow her to have some of these more casual interactions also with somebody who may not um, have uh, the time to really get a, a solid primer on her communication device before they interact with her. Um, and so I think that transition is something that has been definitely on our minds and, and ab about the job as well, like sort of what would be the best match for, for her and something that she finds um, enjoyable and fulfilling for that, so. Absolutely. And I think one thing I've experienced in working with all of you guys on her team and her family is that you guys have such open minds and you're very, um, strong advocates for getting the opportunity for her to try lots of things. So I think that's such a good, such good advice for people is to keep that open mind and be, you know, looking at all the options. Stasha, it looks like you have something ready. Go ahead. The transition to adulthood was very hard on me. I would like to begin this story by quoting Einstein. He said, everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. This story will illustrate why I can relate very strongly to this quote. Oh. I have a couple of learning disabilities as well. Learning disabilities are neurological issues. Oh. With this disability, the brain is wired differently for learning. Students with a learning disability is just as smart or smarter and than their classmates. <laughs> Some well-known people had learning disabilities, including Walt Disney and Whoopi Goldberg. Even Einstein could not read until he was nine, and he was kicked out of school. <gasps> we need support to process the information that the teacher is teaching. With the right support, people with a learning disability can be very successful in school and go on to have distinguished careers. I have dyslexia and dyscalculia. Dyslexia is where a student has difficulties understanding written words. When I was growing up, when I was trying to read, the words just looked as if they were groups of letters without meaning. Sometimes, I would study the vertical patterns that were between the words. I tried my hardest to read, but I just couldn't. I felt embarrassed and so dumb. My grade school teachers couldn't figure it out. They knew I was very intelligent on the rest of the subjects. I was in a couple of classes for learning disabilities for reading and math. I didn't mind because I knew the teachers were really trying to help me. When someone read the books to me, I understood the content. Therefore, for most of my education, I was mainstreamed except for reading and math. We thought it was just a part of my CP and if I worked hard enough I would to be able to read. Nobody really realized that I had dyslexia until I went to college at Whitewater. They called it a reading disability, and they showed me the coolest tool that their students use. It highlights the words while it is reading out loud. So, I could actually follow along. When I was reading without assistance, my eyes got tired or I would have a spasm, and I will lose my place. Once I realized that my reading problem was just another disability, and there were tools to help me, I was so relieved that water sprung to my eyes and I had to swallow back my emotions during that college interview. Unexpectedly, my reading improved. And now I can actually read short paragraphs without assistance. 
DVR misdiagnosed me with a cognitive disability. They gave me a standardized test to come to this wrong conclusion. They didn't accommodate for my learning disabilities. They tested me on reading manually, but they did not test my comprehension of the material. Standardized tests has their place if used correctly. However, they can be quite dangerous if people are trying to decide a student's future because the tests only show a slice of a person's intelligence. There is nothing wrong with having a cognitive disability. I discovered that most people with a cognitive disability are very caring and funny. They can be geniuses in sports or the arts and making friends. The issue with DVR giving me the label of a cognitive disability was simply that we need different supports to be successful. To make a long story short, I worked day and night to get accepted into UW Whitewater to shed the wrong label. Besides, it was always my dream to go away to college to study art. One of the main reasons that I decided to go to Whitewater was their art program. College was the hardest and the most fun thing that I have ever done. Oh my goodness, Sasha, that story is so fantastic. I wish that we could continue talking with everyone forever, but we're, unfortunately we are over time, so I think we should end. But there's a really lovely comment in the chat that I want to read to you guys too. Anne says, Sasha and Landon, you are amazing. It is clear that patience from your communication partners is critical. If they fail in that primary skill, they're losing out on your beauty and wisdom. Thank you so much. And I couldn't say it better myself. So we want to thank everyone for being here today. Becky, Lindsay, Stasha, and Landon. Your experiences are so important and wonderful. And we can't thank you enough for sharing them. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. We just appreciate everyone being here. Appreciate the panel and um, all the participants. So thank you. And again, there will be a poll that will pop up. And for the participants, if you could um, participate in that poll, um, scroll down to the bottom and submit those answers. Oh. And I think if you guys um, don't want to hang around for the poll, you can definitely head out. But again, thank you guys so much. This was just a wonderful day and it's lovely to see all your faces. Landon, good luck getting that land with your dad. <laughs>